وكذلك أوحينا إليك روحا من أمرنا ما كنت تدري ما الكتاب ولا الإيمان ولكن جعلناه نورا ولكن جعلناه نورا نهدي به من نشاء من عبادنا وإنك لتهدي إلى صراط مستقيم صراط الله الذي له ما في السماوات وما في الأرض ألا إلى الله تصير الأمور السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته and welcome to our show Solutions. My name is Bilal Abdul Karim, and on this program, Solutions, we discuss real problems with real solutions. We're going to be discussing many different topics. However, today we're going to be talking about a thorny topic, and that topic is peacefulness versus violence in Islam. Now, I want to start by saying the purpose of this show is so that we can have a dialogue and that our Muslim brothers and sisters as well as any dear non-Muslims that might be watching the show would get a good understanding of Islam and Islamic topics so as not to get their uh, understanding from unauthentic sources for example. The first thing I would like to discuss in this topic is what does Islam stand for? The Prophet, the Messenger of Allah, Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, Inna Allah rafiq, yuhibbu rifq, yu'ati ala rifq, ma la yu'ati ala al-umf. And this means, as the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, Verily, Allah is gentle and loves gentleness. He gives due to gentleness, that which he does not give due to harshness. And in another place, well, actually in the Quran, in the fifth chapter, Surah Al-Ma'idah, verse number 32, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, and this is very, very important, so please key into what I'm trying to say and what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says. If anyone killed a person not in retaliation of murder or to spread mischief, in the land, it would be as if he killed all mankind. And if anyone saved a life, it would be as if he saved the life of all mankind. This is what Islam stands for. This is what Islam, its very name, Islam, peaceful submission. In another place in the Quran, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala also says, Allah does not forbid you to deal justly and kindly with those who fought not against you on account of religion, nor drove, nor drove you out of your homes. Verily, Allah loves those who deal with equity. And this is in the 60th chapter of the Quran, verse number 8. As you can see, Islam is a religion that promotes peace. Now, I began by saying that this particular topic is a thorny one. It's particularly thorny because everyone understands the uh, political climate and things that are happening here today. Uh, I myself, I'm from America. I'm from New York, actually. I came from Brooklyn. So I'm not unaware of what goes on in uh, the cultures of the West. So with this in mind, I want to get right into our topic here today. I'm going to uh, introduce to you my brother, Musa McGuire. He's also from America, and he is from Wisconsin. So let's give salams to him, and let's begin right away with our topic at hand. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Wa alaikum wa salam wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. So we're going to begin our topic right away, and because uh, we have a lot of ground to cover. Of course. Now, my first question to you is this. Do Muslims, in your opinion, as you've been, you've traveled, been in and around America, do Muslims hate Americans? 
Well, the basic answer to that question is no. Um, you know, it's very clear that, especially with, with our communities in America, um, Muslims uh, uh, make, a, make a strong effort to, to fit into the society. And for the most part, historically, American society has been very welcoming to Muslims. Uh, and there is a real value of religious pluralism in American society that has allowed Muslims to come from all over the world and to live and to practice our religion. Um, and, you know, in fact, when you, when you go to travel around the states and you go to cities, you do see Muslims representing the whole world uh, and, and trying to do their best to live in the country peacefully. Um, now, of course, we live in a time now, as you said, where there's a lot of issues and there's a lot of tension with the American community. Um, and, you know, in this sense, I think a lot of Muslims may feel frustrated that Americans don't understand their position in the world better than, ben, better than they do. That the, the Americans they meet in their communities are very kind, uh, very welcoming, very, very uh, uh, tolerant. Uh, you know, I even have a, a case when, um, when uh, a after the events of September 11th, I was living in Texas. Uh, and, you know, I didn't know quite what to expect from, from the people living around the masjid. And one day I came to the masjid and there was a, a, a box of cookies that had been brought by some, some ladies who lived near the masjid just to show that they weren't angry at us and just to show that they supported us. And I think this is the kind of experience that Muslims have had with Americans. But when you look at the American uh, positions in the world and the policies in the world and the way that you know, America has, has supported policies that have hurt Muslim countries or continued to, su to support policies in, in this area, you know, I think Muslims do feel a frustration that the American people aren't more aware of these problems because they believe that you know, if those people, those good people they know from their communities knew about this, they would be much more willing to, to, to try to stop it. They'd be much more willing to get involved. I think that's key because uh, at the events of September 11th, I was in the Bronx in, in New York, mm. and I saw the reaction from the people. I mean, I move around through the, the city to city, and everybody knows I'm Muslim. I have a beard. I'm Bilal. And I just say, hey, Steve. Hi, Jimmy. How you doing? Uh, Barbara, whatever. And there's no problem. It's almost as if the news media will paint a certain picture that when you go and you actually move around in the ground, you don't see that picture. I go into a store. People talk with me. I talk with them. They might even ask me about Islam. They see my wife. She wears hijab. Actually, we were in, um, we were in Oregon at one time. And um, a woman came over to my wife and asked her, wow, why do you wear that hijab? Or she didn't say hijab, of course. But why do you wear th this outfit? And she began a dialogue, and we began to discuss it. So, I mean, do you get the impression that a lot of what's taking place is taking place in the media, and it's not really indicative in terms of what's happening on the ground? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, you know, the medium is, uh, you know, by its, the, the media is by its very n name a medium that stands between people or stands between nations, stands between uh, individuals or citizens and their knowledge about the country they're living in and their, their knowledge about the world. Um, and one of the disadvantages is, is for many Americans, they don't know anything about Muslims other than what they see on the TV. Now, if, if a person knows someone in their community and they've spent time with them and they've learned about them, and then they see an image on television about that person that is completely different, th they have something to compare. Um, and I think that's the case for a lot of Americans who, you know, in their own way are skeptical of what they see on the media. They're, they're not ready to trust or believe everything they see. And they know Muslims in their personal life. They know that Muslims are generous people. They're kind people. They know that if they have a Muslim neighbor, they don't fear for their safety. Uh, and so, uh, you know, they see, it, they see a, a contradiction. But unfortunately for a lot of Americans who live in places where there isn't a strong Muslim population, uh, the only message they're getting is from the media. And that is where we really start to see a caricature of Islam as a religion of violence. Uh, I agree. I agree with that. Now, what I want to do now is we asked uh, a couple of people about terrorism, mm. to define the word terrorism. So let's see what they, uh, what they came back with, and then we'll discuss it a little bit more, inshallah. Okay, inshallah. Terrorism is this uh, whatever act that somebody does to terrify or hurt somebody else whether physically or emotionally or a anything that anybody does to hurt somebody else. Terrorism? Mm -hmm. Well, 
terrorism is um, derived from the word terror, which means, you know, uh, scaring, scaring somebody. And it doesn't, I mean, well, I, I don't really know. Um, it's just the act of, you know, um, like uh, bringing fear into people's hearts. And that, and that I don't really like, you know, support. I define terrorism as uh, killing and uh, torturing and hurting innocent people who uh, shouldn't be who shouldn't be tortured. Well, these are some interesting responses, but um, I myself I don't like to use the word terrorism because we're not speaking about terrorism. For example, you stand behind a door and you say "boo" to somebody. Mm -hmm. And the person oh, goes like this and say, okay, well, I terrorized you. Okay, linguistically, that's it. But in the political atmosphere, it doesn't mean that. And there is no single definition that is accepted internationally in terms of what is terrorism. Because if you listen to their responses, we can attach exactly what they said to almost everything. What do you think about that? Yeah, you're absolutely right. Uh, I think this is a term that... Um, you know, has really acquired, really lost any sense of meaning, uh, especially the way it's used in the, in the media and in popular uh, discourse. I think the, the, the last gentleman we saw uh, offered a, a, a more traditional de definition of, of what terrorism means in terms of uh, attacking innocent people or civilians or random violence. But at the same time, these are things that are done by, um, you know, individuals. They're done by things that are done by small groups. They're things that are done by small weapons. They're things that are done by, by uh, armies and governments. Um, and so, again, we're not left with, with any real meaningful definition of terrorism besides, uh, you know, a form of violence that, that is, you know, considered unjust. Um, and, you know, when we, see, when we see a lot of the popular uses, especially these days, it's really become a code um, you know, for those people who are, who, are, who are described as being on the other side of a conflict. So, for instance, a lot of times you'll look at some of the military conflicts that the, that the, that the United States is involved in right now uh, or other countries are involved in. And those who are opposing them, who are, who are often Muslims, um, are being described as terrorists. Now, I, I wouldn't deny that Muslims are capable of terrorism or that Muslims have committed terrorism, and I wouldn't deny that that's possible for, for America or for any other country. Um, however, when we're dealing with, uh, in one sense, a military context with, with people fighting, uh, military forces fighting each other, in another context we're dealing with, um, you know, people attacking civilians. Um, in another sense you're dealing with, you know, a group of people who go and bomb a public place or else you're dealing with a, uh, you know, a, 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 a fighter pilot or a, a military plane that bombs a market. You know, all these, uh, and terrorism is being selectively used here. Um, and so it's important that people realize that, you know, if we want to come to an understanding of this issue... It's a propaganda tool. Exactly. It's exactly. a propaganda tool. Right. But now, I want to ask you, how do you explain this phenomenon? Propaganda is really waged... Uh, or has its barrel set towards Islam. Yet Islam is still, even after the events of September 11th, the fastest growing religion. People are continuing to come to Islam literally in droves. I mean, how do you explain that? It is the negative press that they're receiving actually working against them? Well, I think propaganda succeeds if people uh, are satisfied with the propaganda. Um, I mean, when we're dealing with something that's a simplistic message or that is, a, is, is an image underneath which there, there may be a, a lot of distortion of facts, you know, anybody who's interested enough to go and actually research the facts, um, you know, is going to find out that, you know, what they're seeing is not true. And that's going to intrigue them further to say, well, what, what is the real thing here? What is real Islam? Uh, I heard a story, I read a story recently about a young lady in Indiana who, after September 11th, was, was basically convinced that Islam was a violent religion. And so she was interested in learning how could a religion you know, define itself around violence. And it didn't make sense to her that anybody would follow a relig religion like this. So she started to research it, uh, and what she found was very different. And uh, after a few years, she became Muslim. So um, 
you know, th this is a story that I think a lot of people had because, you know, a lot of people in America are interested in learning beyond what they hear on the news. They're learning beyond, uh, you know, the, the sound bites and the, the, the images flashing in front of them. And so anyone who, who wants to investigate Islam is going to find a much different picture. I think it's important to note, um, I mean, I know you, but they don't know you, and even me myself. Islam came into my life by way of seeing the good character of the Muslims, how they conduct themselves, their interaction with each other, and it had nothing to do with um, uh, someone coming saying, you know, with a gun, be Muslim or else. It, it, it wasn't about that. Um, and I think you find a lot of people who accept Islam, that they accept it because of the peacefulness that they feel in their hearts. Absolutely. I think, uh, you know, the estimates say that we have six to ten million Muslims in America right now. A good portion of those are, are people like us who, who accepted Islam later in life. And I don't think a single one of them was forced to accept Islam by any means. There was no coercion. Uh, I mean, you know, in America we do have that, that absolute freedom to choose our beliefs and what we're going to follow. And in that system, you know, weighing all the different options we had, people like you and me came to the conclusion that Islam is in fact the truth. Uh, and it, it had nothing to do with coercion. Yeah, yeah. Now, the question I have for you is this. I'm just going to just throw it right out there. Okay. All right? Okay. Get us both in trouble. <laughs> <laughs> is Western society a peaceful society? Well, you know, it's a good question for this topic because, uh, again, when, when we think about this issue of violence in Islam, you know, when, when people raise the, the, the image of, uh, of violence in Islam, you know, it's usually dealing with certain regions of the world, certain conflicts where there are, you know, there are two sides fighting. Um, and yet somehow people imagine it to be, a, you know, a constant issue of violence, that the, that the society is, is embroiled in violence. And, and I know for, for people like you and, and me who have traveled a little bit in the Muslim world, you find that the societies, even when they're not uh, you know, completely uh, uh, sort of dominated by an Islamic system, that the, 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 the culture of the people and the morals of the people and the manners of the people that have been developed through Islam make the society a much more secure place than what we find in America. Now, um, you know, in America, there's, there, is, there is really an epidemic of violence. You know, I think if you, if you took some of the cities that we're, that we're used to hearing about in international news, uh, say Belfast or, uh, you know, Beirut at certain times, uh, and you actually compared the, 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 the violence in those cities mm -hmm. and the, the number of deaths in those cities to the number of deaths and murders in America, you might not see as much of a contrast as you expect. And for, for most people in America are aware of this, that there is, you know, there are problems with crime, there are problems with, with violence. This is in spite of the fact that, you know, America still is the, the, the richest country in the world. So, uh, you know, it's, it's important that we, that we take this issue of violence and peacefulness beyond the level of military conflict, uh, sort of international tensions, and really look at the way that it enters into the, the everyday life of people. Because I know that I found personally that, that life as a Muslim is much more peaceful. The kind of challenges that I bring on myself to be patient, yeah. to, 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 to avoid anger. Uh, you know, these are the parts of the daily life of the Muslim. Uh, and these are the things that develop discipline to, to avoid this kind of violence. Now I have one more question before we go to a break. So uh, I'll throw it at you rapid fire. All right. Even before the events of September 11th, and certainly afterwards, Islam is really in the spotlight. Why? Well, I mean, there's, there's some different reasons for that. Um, first of all, we have to look a little bit historically and realize that uh, for a long time, the, the United States uh, was involved in, in the Cold War conflict. Uh, and it was very easy for people to imagine the world as a, a, in two blocks. And, it, and, and for a large part, it was in two blocks between the, 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 the communism that led by the Soviet Union and uh, the American, uh, say, say uh, democratic capitalism. Um, and after you know, that ended and, uh, and, and the world began to enter the era of, of real sort of integrated globalization, there was a tendency among some people to, to, to look for a new enemy, a new threat. Um, and so when you look around the world and you're trying to identify a global civilization 
that may not be uh, completely aligned with the values of the West, it's very easy to single out Islam. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. And and it's you know it's important I think that we that we recognize that Islam is in fact a, a global civilization and and it has been for for 1,400 years. Um, but the, the the impression that that gives some people that it's it's in constant immediate conflict with 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 America and the West on every single issue is just inaccurate. Sure. I think I share that same view. Well, what we're going to do, we're going to go to a break, and we're going to come back with a very, very special guest. He's going to sit with us, and he'll be able to give us, inshallah, some insight into this topic of peacefulness versus violence in Islam. Wassalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. <laughs> Anyone who chooses other than Al-Islam as a religion, as a way, it won't be accepted from him. This Qur'an has to be understood by the way the companions of Rasulullah understood the Qur'an. We disconnect ourselves from the actions of certain Muslims who oppress people and kill people unjustly. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh and welcome back to our program Solutions where we are discussing the topic of peacefulness versus violence in Islam. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam made mention that ignorance is a disease but its cure is to ask. So that's what we're going to do today. When you don't know something, you ask the people of knowledge or the people who have knowledge. And now I'd like to talk about my next guest. His name is Dr. Ridha Bidea. He has a PhD from Al-Azhar University. He is a translator of books and a writer about different Islamic topics. He's a teacher of Islamic studies and translation. And he's been given dawah for about 15 years. So not only does he have the academic credentials, but as well he has the experience and practical application. So I would like to, for everyone to give a warm salam to our guest, Dr. Ridha Bidea. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Wa alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa Thank you very much. Wa alaikum wa barakatuh. Thank you very much. And this is my brother, Musa Maguire. And we always have our little joke, you know. He's my brother, even though he doesn't look like me. <laughs> <laughs> this is the beauty of Islam. Yeah. Now, yeah. now, I understand that uh, you recently delivered a paper at Friends University in Kansas entitled The Impact of 9-11 on Viewing Islam in America. Can you tell us something about that? Sure. Um, in fact, 9-11 was a double mixed or a double-edged weapon, as they say, or a mixed blessing. And as they say in English, one man's poison is another man's meat. Uh, before 9-11, very few people in America knew about Islam. The media and the image of Islam is very distorted, so people have a very bad impression when it comes to Islam. And 9-11 came and added more fuel to the fire. And the first impression was like, panic, then people started like thinking how to react, and there were some reactions that I covered at the beginning of my paper, and then people started saying, why? If what happened is done by Muslims, why? And what Islam is all about? And they started to study Islam, and this was the, uh, the other aspect of the event itself, which is the rising interest in Islam. At that time, the number one bestseller was the Qur'an. Exactly. Yes. Exactly. And again, also let me quote you at the beginning of introducing the second segment, people discover that they know nothing about Islam. And they used to attack Islam based on ignorance. So when they started to educate themselves about Islam and the teachings of Islam, they found out that it's the truth and they accepted Islam. So we have to differentiate between the faith and the followers of the faith. 
if it happens or if it's proven that Muslims have done something wrong, we should not attack Islam. We should not accuse Islam. Mm. Because, you know, it applies to all other faiths. I mean, Christians do something wrong. Jews do something wrong. And followers of all other faiths, they, they commit mistakes and they make mistakes. So when they do something, we have to differentiate between the faith and the followers. Yes. And, and people are not representatives of the faith. They represent only themselves. Yes. Now, I have a question, and I'll just throw it right out there at you as I do with Musa. Yeah. Was Islam spread by the sword? I would say yes. But which sword? It's the sword of the intellect. It's not the real sword that people use to kill others. And uh, let me just share with you some facts that would support what I said. Um, where is the largest Muslim community in the world now? I think Musa could answer. I think Indonesia, right? MashaAllah, excellent. That's the right answer. So who can tell me back in history who started a war to take Islam to Indonesia? It was the behavior or the conduct, as Musa mentioned in the first segment, it was the behavior of the merchants who traveled to Indonesia. And the same thing applies to uh, China. The same thing applies to India. Now, the second largest Muslim community is in India. Islam is the fastest growing religion in the West today. Who is using a sword to force people to embrace Islam? Again, another question. Islam ruled over Spain for eight centuries. And Christians and Jews exercised their faith with no compulsion. Nobody forced them to convert. And when the Crusades came there, they wiped out the Muslims and the Jews. Another question is, if, again, if you look at a country like Egypt, there are 10% of the population are Coptic Orthodox Christians and they have been living with the Muslims for centuries. Who obliged them to convert to Islam? Nobody forces them. And if we go back to the teachings and instructions of Islam, in fact this is a contradiction if we say that Islam uses force to convert people. The root of the word Islam is Silm and Salima. Other derivatives are Salam. And linguistically speaking, Islam means surrender, submission, peaceful submission. To whom? To the one who gave you life. So uh, how would we understand the statement from the Prophet Wasallam that uh, paradise lies underneath the shade of swords? How do we understand this? How do we use this word? That's, that's the question. Because as I said, I just wanted to add something to the previous point, sure. which is verse number 256 in chapter 2, where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, let there be no compulsion in religion. So if this is the instruction of the Quran, how come that the Prophet would be contradicting himself and asking people to kill others in the name of spreading the word of God? Again, in verse number 6, chapter 109, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, for you is your religion, and for me is my religion. This is the tolerance of Islam. Nobody is forced to abandon his religion and embrace Islam. But yet, using this word, sometimes you have to use force or power. And let me just ask you a very uh, simple question. Why do we have police nowadays? Why do we have prisons? To maintain the order. Because there are some people who need to be straightened up. So at some point of time, if someone comes to your house and attacks you, what will you do? You'll have to defend yourself. So this is one of the meanings in Islam. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in verse number 190 in chapter 2, fight in the cause of Allah those who fight against you. You don't initiate the war, but if someone comes to fight you, this is we have, this is why we have the Ministry of Defense in every country. You need to be able to defend yourself. So sometimes you have to use force. But how would you use force? So defending your honor 
defending your country, defending your faith, this is one of the obligations in Islam. So, let me just conclude with this. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says at the, end of the, at the end of the verse, He said, but do not transgress. You have to stop by the limits ordained by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And one more thing I want to add here is, there is also, at some point of time, you can initiate war or you can, you know, you can start by using force to stop injustice and oppression. Would you say that the terms, understanding the political climate here today, jihad and terrorism are one and the same, as it's popularized in the media, would you say that that's correct? Absolutely no. Uh, I totally disagree because Again, according to the distorted image of Islam and playing with terminology, they try to make a link between terrorism and jihad. And I think you introduced some people who try to, uh, uh, let's say, define the word terrorism. And also, I think Brother Musa also made a comment on that. So, we all know that terrorism means scaring people bringing out fear into the hearts of people, uh, getting people like taking the, their, feel, their feelings of security. But jihad, the root of the word in Arabic is juhd, which means effort. And jihad means exerting effort to attain a certain objective. And jihad, according to Islam, is of two types. It's, there is a jihad which is within and there is a jihad which is without a jihad which is within is when you struggle against your own lusts and desires you know and stop being like animals you have to respect the fact that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has blessed you with an intellect so you do not submit to your desires and end up losing everything so you have to rise above your lusts and desires this is, this is some sort of jihad also, when you struggle against the devil that whispers into your, into your ears to do something wrong, again, this is again another type of jihad. It's jihad within. Mm -hmm. But when it comes to the jihad without, which is, I think I mentioned that in my previous uh, uh, talk when I said, uh, when you defend or when you struggle against those who come to attack you, when you defend yourself, this is jihad in defense. And I think this is something acceptable to all human beings on earth now. You know, you know it's interesting that you bring that up in terms of the, the, the word jihad, because even, even in our, our recent history, uh, the word jihad in America in the 1980s actually had a positive meaning. Because you know, in this era of the Cold War, where, where the United States was committed to, to, fighting, uh, to fighting communism and saw communism as a threat, you know, communism was, was, was under the Soviet Union, was, was fairly um, equal in its repression of all religions. And of course we know that, you know, in the 80s the communist uh, forces invaded Afghanistan. And it was a major, uh, you know, uh, effort of, of U.S. policy to su support the resistance to that occupation. Uh, and this, this was a time where the word jihad itself was, was, was spoken in the circles of power in America in a good way, that we wanted to support the jihad. And sometimes you'll even see writing about this subject that talks about America's jihad in Afghanistan. Uh, and so yet, you know, years later, w the, the same term has acquired a totally different meaning. Uh, and yet, you know, 20 years ago, America itself was, 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 uh, was looking at this kind of term as, as, a, as a legitimate means of resistance, exactly what you described, where people come in to repress the religion and then they need to be pushed out. I think it's the point that you made earlier that this term of terrorism becomes a political tool or a piece of propaganda, depending on who the enemy is. If the enemy, if, if it's an enemy, he's a terrorist. If he's a friend, even though he's doing terrorist activities, he is, he has the right to defend himself or herself or uh, as it's stated. Exactly. But uh, my question to you is also, is there such a term as offensive jihad in Islam? I would say yes. Jihad does not mean all the time, you know, the defensive aspect. 
because at some point of time, if we quote verse number 75 in chapter 4, where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala states the fact that why shouldn't you fight against the oppressors who ill-treat the weak and oppressed people amongst men, women, children, and old-aged. And these people cry to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala saying, O oh Allah, find us a way out of this oppressing community. So, again, in, at this point, we need to, to, to initiate a war against the oppressors, to stop injustice and oppression. And this is one of the, one of the meanings of jihad, as I mentioned before. Yes. Does Islam condone the killing of innocent men, women, and children? Of course, no. And uh, again, as I, as I explained before, the word Islam means submission to the will of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And this gives you two types of peace. Peace of the heart and peace of the mind. This is the inner peace. But yet you get something else which is outer peace in your relationship with the whole world, the whole universe, including inanimate objects, plants, animals, let alone human beings. And there was a stone where the Prophet ﷺ mentioned that every time he passes by that stone, the stone would give salam to the Prophet because of his kindness, even to inanimate objects. Anas ibn Malik radiallahu an, mentioned that he served in the house of the Prophet ﷺ for 10 years. He said, I've never seen the Prophet hitting or you know, acting unjustly even to inanimate objects in the house. One more thing, also the Prophet ﷺ told us that a woman has treated a cat in an unjust way. She will go to hellfire because she locked the cat. She didn't give it food and she didn't let the cat get out to get its food. Yet, on the contrary, there was another woman who was a prostitute and she was walking in the desert and she was almost dying out of thirst. And then she found a well. She went to the well and she drank her fill. And she continued walking in the desert. She saw a dog that was licking the pebbles, and it was almost in the same condition. So she went back to the well and she filled one of her shoes and gave it to the dog. So the Prophet ﷺ reported that Allah forgave all her sins because of her kindness towards the animal. And let me quote the verse that you quoted at the beginning of the show. Verse number 32, chapter 5. Where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, If anyone kills a person, not in retaliation, nor in... Um, I, can, I, can, I can remember the, the spread, second... Uh, mischief to spread in mischief land. in the land. Mm -hmm. So these are two reasons... You know, because you can kill someone in Qisas, like in retaliation. Sure. And also, there are some people who spread mischief in the land, as, as you know nowadays. So, other than these two reasons, if someone kills a person for no reason, it is as if he has killed humanity at large. Yes. And if you save the life of one person, it is as if you have saved the life of humanity at large. This is the call of Islam. It well, calls for peace. We're going to continue this discussion with our guest, Dr. Rida Bidea, and we will be back in just a few short moments, insha'Allah ta'ala, God willing. Wassalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. I would like to begin our show by discussing the topic which is seeking knowledge. And now I'd like to begin our quest for seeking knowledge with an ayat from the 39th chapter of the Quran, verse number nine. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh and welcome back to our show Solutions and our rather uh, thorny topic for the day. <laughs> We're here with uh, my brothers Musa McGuire and Dr. Ridha Bidea. 
and uh, we'd like to continue our discussion. Um, we did ask some questions to uh, some people outside of our studio audience, but before we go to that, I would like to ask you, speaking honestly, people read the Quran and you see repeatedly throughout the Quran the command to fight, fight, fight. How do you equate this command to fight repeatedly throughout the Quran with the religion of peace and submission? How do you equate those two? That's a good question. Um, let me quote you previously when you said that the Prophet ﷺ said, ignorance is a disease, and for every disease there is a remedy. And the, the, the remedy for ignorance is to seek knowledge and to ask. So people, when they read the Quran, they should know how to read the Quran because the Quran has coherence when it comes to topics. And you cannot take one verse out of context and try to isolate it from its context. For example, if we quote verse number 5 and verse number 6 in chapter 9, where it was talking mainly about fighting that was in progress at that time. So when you try to read this and try to think that this is a general directive of the Quran, here is one of the grave mistakes that people do. It was the command of put down the polytheists, beleaguer them, ambush them, wherever you find them. Yet, if you go to the very next verse, which is verse number 6, it says, If any one of the polytheists seeks your protection, protect him, and let him hear the word of God, and get him to a secure place. Don't you see a contradiction if we say that the first one is a general direction of the Quran? So, you have to read, when you read a verse, you have to read the context. You have to read the previous verse and the following verse. You have to know what is the main topic of these verses. This is number one. Also, when you go to the interpretation of the Quran, the people who interpret the Quran gives you explanatory notes where they give you like the reason for the revelation of this verse. If I quote also two other verses where the word fight is mentioned, in fact, let me first quote the first time that fighting was permissible. If you go to chapter 22, verse number 18, where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is talking about the people who were persecuted and oppressed in Mecca for 13 years, then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, permission is given to those who have been ill-treated for a long time. And Allah is able to give them and grant them victory. So this was the first time, you know, because many times the companions of the Prophet used to go to him and say, why shouldn't, why shouldn't we defend ourselves? These people are exercising oppression and persecution against us. And then he would say, Allah didn't command me even to defend myself. But this was the first time they were given permission to fight in defense. But if I quote verse number 190 and 193 in chapter 2, where I quoted the first one previously, which is, Fight in the cause of Allah those who fight against you and do not transgress, because Allah does not like the transgressors. If you continue, then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Fight in the cause of Allah, in, 90, in, in 193, Fight in the cause of Allah until justice and faith in Allah prevail, and that people will submit to God. So again, it gives a second chance for those who resist and, you know, never try to give themselves a chance to think and see that they are wrong. It says, if they cease, if they cease, if they stop aggression and persecution and, you know, spreading mischief in land, then these are the only people who you will take as an enemy and fight against them. So we should not, again, isolate the text out of the context. Right. So this is one way yeah, of trying to understand yes. the Quran. Yes. 
we asked some people outside of our studio audience the question, do Muslims have the right to defend their land from invaders even though those invaders say that they are liberators? And we're going to see what their response is. Let's take a look at what they said. Uh, I think, yes, uh, Muslims have that right because uh, that's their own land and they are uh, totally free to do what they want to do. That's not the, their opinion uh, that they are not, uh, someone has to liberate them. That's the other's opinions. That's the invader's opinion. And that's not the Muslims' own opinion and that's why they have to defend their own land. Uh, that's my opinion. Of course, of course, anybody has the right to defend his land. And Muslims are like anybody else have this right, so of course. Yes, I believe they do, because whatever you call yourself, that's your own notation for yourself. Uh, who, who's, the, who's the one who's, who's to choose? The, the people who live in the country themselves or the, the outsiders? Uh, it's the same anywhere else. I mean, uh, no one's going to come and say we're your enemy. They're going to say we're your friend. And uh, they do that to make things easy on you, but uh, that's not really the, the case. Yes, they do have the right to do that. They, they have, Muslims have the right to defend their land at any cost. Whether that cost seems right to them or wrong, it's up to them. Okay, well, these are some of the responses that we got. Now, I'd like to make a, bring up one quick point. The last response that we had, where the brother said that Muslims have the right to defend their country at any cost, whether it seems right or it seems wrong. Musa and I were discussing the importance of having a minhaj or a methodology and not just uh, uh, basically doing whatever it is that we want because jihad is an act of worship. So there has to be, with every act of worship, there has to be a process, a methodology, so to speak. I mean, wh wh what are your thoughts on that? Well, I, I think it's, you know, of course it's natural that, that anybody who's invaded is going to want to defend themselves. Um, but I think as Muslims, we always have to remember that, that we have a higher cause than, you know, uh, our ethnicity or our nation uh, or, you know, nationalism or any principle built around that. And we should expect from ourselves that, you know, we would be successful only after we really do follow that proper Islamic methodology that you talk about. Doctor? Yeah, first of all, let me address the, the point that you raised at the end of your question. There is uh, a rule in Islam that says that the objective has to be halal, which is lawful. And the means to attain your objective must also be halal, which is lawful. For example, nobody can say that uh, I want to earn my living, so I will be selling alcohol. If you want to earn your living, which is something lawful, you have to remember all the time that you are a servant. You are not free. You are a servant of God. So if you claim to be a servant of God, you have to follow the rules set by the Sharia, which is the Islamic law. So I hope I made myself clear on this point. The objective should be lawful. And the means to attain the objective must also be lawful. Yes. So I, I disagree with the, with the brother who mentioned this at the end of the talk. Yes. But addressing the main question, which is, do Muslims have the right to defend their lands? It's an obligation. It's not a right. It's an obligation. And if you even lose your life in defense of your country, you are considered a martyr. So it's an obligation on Muslims that they defend their land, they defend their honor, they defend their property. But again, all the time, remember, it's an act of worship. You are doing this because you are obedient to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and you are doing it to please Him. In the meantime, if I go back to address what the brother mentioned, there is etiquette when it comes to jihad. And now we are talking about jihad in defense. Somebody as an aggressor coming to invade my land, coming you know, to take my wealth and property. The Prophet ﷺ taught the companions that there are etiquettes when it comes to fighting, no plundering, no killing of children, no killing of women, no killing of old people, not even, you know, cutting trees, not even killing sheep. You should not fight, but only those who fight against you. If you find somebody like 
you know, worshiping God in a church or in a synagogue, you do not fight him. You do not kill him. See how tolerant Islam is? Because we are not, you know, blood suckers. We are not killing people. We are not fighting for the sake of killing. Because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, if they cease, if they stop, even in the middle of fighting, then you stop. So it, it, you are defending on the basis of the teachings and the instructions of Islam. It's not up to the people to decide the means. Jazakallah khair for that, yeah. that response. Now, what we need to do now is to go to our studio audience and see if we have any questions. Um, I believe we have a question in the second row. Uh, I'm Ahmed uh, and I'm from Bosnia and uh, I'd like to say that uh, no one forced me to embrace Islam and that uh, Islam deals with all people justly. Can you uh, comment on that a little bit more? Thank you. Doctor, can you comment on that? Yeah, sure. Thank you very much for your question and uh, welcome as a brother in Islam. Uh, before you become a Muslim, you are a brother in humanity because we all belong to one father and one mother. As the Quran says, where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, we have created you out of a single male and female. And what's the, what's the rational behind creation? Allah is telling us in the next phrase, saying, so as to get to know one another. And before that, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, we have created you out of a single male and female and made you into nations and tribes. So if you come from Bosnia, and I'm from Egypt, and he's from America, and we have different brothers here from different parts of the world, Islam knows nothing about racism, ethnicity. Islam is the faith that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala announced on the farewell pilgrimage of the Prophet said, Today, I have completed your religion for you, and I have perfected my blessings upon you, and I have accepted Islam as a religion for you. Islam is not a new faith. In fact, it's a continuation. It's the same message of all prophets. So, if you, because some people only know that Islam, thinking that Islam is the religion of Prophet Muhammad Wasallam, But in fact, many people do not know that, if I ask you a very simple question, what about the people who accepted Prophet Noah and they died as believers? How would you call them? They're Muslims. Another question. Abraham, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, and Ishmael, while they were building the Kaaba, what did they say? They were praying and they said, Tawaffana Muslimin. That was one of their prayers. Oh Allah, make us die in submission to you. What does it mean? As Muslims. Again, what about the people who followed Moses? And here we have a brother called Moses. He's a Muslim. <laughs> okay? And we well, have this is the, is, the, is the English translation. <laughs> exactly. And we have a brother here called Bilal. And Bilal was from Abyssinia. He was the caller for Adhan. So we have different colors, different nationalities. Simply because Allah says, I have created you out of a single male and female and made you into tribes and nations so that you get to know one another, not to kill one another. To know one another. So this is one of the main you know, objective of Islam. We, 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 we all belong to different cultures, different races, different, different ethnicities, different countries, because this is the message of Islam. Islam is a universal message. Okay. It's for all people. So the Prophet ﷺ, to clarify this, he said, I and the prophets before me are like some people who came to establish a building. And they finished the building except for one block of brick. So when the people passed by that building, they would say, what a wonderful building, except for that block of brick. He said, I am that block of brick. I came to perfect the building. Mm -hmm. So the Prophet ﷺ was the last ring in a chain of prophets coming to reiterate and reconfirm the same message of all prophets. There is no God worthy of worship but Allah. Know Him, submit yourself to Him, and this is your salvation. Okay. We have another question here in the third row in the back. Go ahead, please. Assalamu alaikum. Wa My name is Sufyan. I'm from Belgium. And I would like you to clarify something on the point of the obligation of jihad. Um, today, Muslims are um, attacked in different parts of the world. 
to, wo to wo which point goes the obligation to all the Muslims today to go there and defend these Muslims as uh, being attacked, being oppressed, and so on. Jazakallah khair. This is a tough one, though. Um, I would say um, to perform jihad, we need to have... Uh, it's not left to everybody to decide jihad, because if we leave it to individuals, then we'll have chaos all around the Muslim world. So jihad would be an obligation for the people in the country where the oppression has started or where the invasion has started. And when it comes to uh, defending your country, this is an obligation imposed upon you. But when it comes to back to history, when the Muslims were one nation, then there was only one ruler, and he's the one to proclaim jihad if any part of the Muslim world, you know, is experiencing an aggression like that. So, I would say that when a country is attacked, it's an obligation on that country to defend itself, and jihad becomes an obligation. And it's the responsibility of all Muslims all around the world to do whatever they can to help them. If they can help them by physically exercising jihad, or if they can do it by, you know, supporting them, you know, wh whatever, with whatever means that they can, or the least thing could be by making dua for them, by praying for them. But at least you have to do something. So it depends on what's available, given the conditions of the Muslim world today. And Allah knows best. Well, unfortunately, unfortunately, Three times, unfortunately, we're just about out of time. So, um, firstly, I would like to thank our distinguished guest, Dr. Ridha Bideya, and, of course, Musa McGuire, but I'm not going to thank you anymore because you, you live here. Yeah. So. <laughs> yeah, I want to thank you, too. It was a very beneficial discussion. Thank you very much, and thank you for having me today. And I would like to say, as alaikum, which is the greeting of Islam, just to tell people that this is Again, one of the distinguishing aspects of Islam, even the greeting, is peace be with you. And this basically wraps up our program for today of solutions. As uh, we've discussed our topic today, and as we made mention that the Prophet ﷺ made mention that ignorance is a disease and the cure is to ask. So we answered some questions here today. So hopefully, inshallah, those who were to receive the message today from Allah, from his messenger, sallallahu alayhi wa if they can spread it amongst the other people, that would be a form of hasanat for them. And I would like to thank you all for joining us, and hopefully we all benefited from the solution. Wa jazakum Allah li kulli khair. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa